Um, um, big button, uh, because you're dropping your fears. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Welcome to the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work full departmental uh, seminar. And today we have for you a very fascinating topic. I'm sure that your interest would have been piqued given all that is happening in the world and right around us. In, in, in particular, um, those of you who've been following um, on television what has been happening in the Middle East, Ukraine, and um, locally, we recently had the, um, the JLP uh, annual conference and um, a number of issues relating to security were raised at that conference. In addition to that, there is a general discussion in the public domain surrounding the issues of security. It is in that context that um, this topic, that is Jamaica's ontological security, gender, economics, and international relations, becomes a very a relevant topic for today. And to help us to discuss this, we have um, a panel made up of five distinguished um, persons who I will get to in a moment um, and who will speak to the topic. Each person has about 15 minutes and after the presentation, then we will open up for questions. Let me welcome those online who are joining us. We hope that we can take some of your questions. Is that correct? I hope that we have all the social media people who will help us to take some of your questions. Um, we will start the ball rolling today <clears throat> with um, Dr. Herbert Gale. And um, Dr. Herbert Gale is the head, of the head of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work. He's an anthropologist who has written extensively and indeed spoken extensively on the issue of violence. Uh, he has done research um, in a number of Caribbean countries, and um, he has done comparative research uh, between the Caribbean and a number of non-Caribbean um, countries. Uh, Dr. Gale is well known in the public domain as he has spoken on television on a wide range of issues, but he specializes in violence um, studies. I'm going to ask him to come to the podium and I'm, many of you might be wondering uh, what is uh, ontological um, security? And as we know, this is a concept which comes out of the work of Giddens. But of course, Giddens um, takes some of that from the psychology uh, around 1960. But of course, <clears throat> he decontextualizes it and speaks extensively to it. Uh, so not only in sociology and anthropology, but we find the concept also being used in international relations. Hence, we have an international relations um, specialist. So I'm going to ask Dr. Gale to come and um, begin our presentation, and he will, of course, clarify the concept and then speak to some of his work uh, that is ongoing. Dr. Gale? All right, let me just say good afternoon. All right, so quite often we hear these terms ontological security right so let's see if we break this down very quickly uh, ontology is actually the latin from which all of this comes from and it's about existentiality uh, students who work in research they understand that the first thing you have to do in research is to search for the ontology meaning to find all the pieces that exist so that you don't make up a problem in your head because a lot of the problems that exist on earth, people actually make them up. <laughs> they are actually problems that don't exist until people begin to make them. And so for, for ontological security, we are concerned about what exists. But security, of course, suggests your, your sense of being safe now and especially in the future. So. When we speak about ontological security, we are talking about a sense of hope, a sense of tomorrow, 
a sense of future. And, and as you heard in, in the introductions, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that this word has been around for quite a while, but of course became popular in the work of Anthony Giddens in the 1980s, uh, and of course drawing from psychology. In 2005, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, in a class on conflict and development, a question was asked in the class that became more than a question, it became a project, it was what are those few things, not a lot, because when you have a lot of things about anything, it becomes difficult to work with. What are those few things that if young people don't have them, they will destroy your country? And that was the way in which the question was asked. And it was quite interesting because people are like, you know, the people who are from first world countries looked around at those of us from the developing countries, to, you know, as if with an attitude to say, well, our countries are not being destroyed by young people. So you answer. And in the class, there were 17 of us who were actually working in 117 countries. Let me go again. There were 17 people in the class who were doing work in 117 countries. And so we started compartmentalizing the assignment. I was given the LAC to work with. The African people were given parts of Africa to work with. And we started using a tool called mini qualitative survey to ask five basic questions. And in the end, we put together a, a set of material which looks like this. The number one thing that young people said in 117 countries, that if they don't have it, Tomorrow makes no sense was food. It's not simple. And it makes complete sense. Food. And of course, without any prejudice, some of us already begun to, to, to assume which countries had food as number one and food as number two and food as number three, right? But we gave we gave the young people uh to list the assignment was for them to list five things they couldn't do without, and without those five things they would have to resort to either organized crime or violence. So food was number one. Number two was actually a sense of safety. And that became very powerful because it was actually 5% ahead of a support system, which is number three. And when we looked at that number two, a lot of the young people complained in the LAC and in the African countries, like in Lesotho, in South Africa and in other areas, that when they live in a violent community and the state was also violent, they had to be grappling now with two sets of violence. And therefore, by the state using suppression, they actually felt less safe. And it was interesting because the same young people said that their parents felt safe. Take your time their parents felt safe. So when their parents are persons over age 45, saw police and soldiers in a violent community, they felt safe because, and the young people quoted, they're not coming for them. They're coming for us. And we also found that, that women, that young women felt ontologically insecure because their brothers were insecure. So we, so we found for the young men across these 117 countries, they were concerned about being killed, while their sisters were concerned about their brothers, who's the breadwinner, and their favorite brother sometimes, being killed. And therefore, we found that from, from that preliminary study, that ontological security could not have been achieved by suppression. That came out very clear. So, and again, in summary, if a set of young people live in a very violent community and the state's primary strategy is suppression, it would sink their ontological security, a sense of safety, driving them into, into, an, in, into what they, they themselves named as group suicide. And that is why we're going to have a psychological presentation because the word, and we're talking about people who, they didn't have PhDs and all of these things, but they understood that they felt dead already 
in Jamaica, we would say, if a dirt, a dirt. So, so, so we found, and El Salvador literally had a large team of, of people. I think we had three persons from the class from El Salvador alone. And, and so when you look at Mano Supadura and all of those programs that came out of the LAC in Brazil and El Salvador, Guatemala and those areas, you then were able to just, just, just listening to these young people, why Mano Supadura, by the way, which means heavy hand and very heavy hand. So you have Mano Dura first and then Mano Supadura, which means very heavy hand, which was not just a, a, a hammer hand, but a big hand. And that was the kind of sledge ideas, which clearly, based on studies in ontological security, has not worked. And it's part of my conviction uh, in the entire LAC saying to governments that you have to pull back from suppression and invest more in making people feel a sense of tomorrow. Because without a sense of tomorrow, then there is very little restriction within each individual not to harm themselves and others. So that is the essence. That is a psychological section, which you're going to hear much more of. But the third one was a support system. Now, young people needed a support system. And, and that is when we had people from psychiatry working with us that explained that every single human being requires at least one stable and consistent. And note those two words, stable and consistent. And we found that literally in the, in, the, in, the, in the areas in the LAC with homicide rates exceeding 30 per 100,000, which was the benchmark my classroom created, they had less than 15% of the young people having one stable and consistent parent. And when we matched those against communities that were stable, we were seeing figures of 65, 70%. And it's interesting because now that we're actually doing some, some, we're doing some violence audits, we're finding the same thing. We're finding in one community 2% of young people saying that they have at least one stable and consistent parent. So stable means that you can, you can vouch that your parents are okay mentally. They're not going to do the craziest things. And consistent means you know, we found a lot of people who said they had a very good parent, but they see the parent every two months. So it wasn't consistent, right? And in fact, what we found in some, in, in most of these countries was less than 1% of young people having two parents who were both stable and consistent. And so we had to dump the ideas of these nuclear and, and Murdochian ideas about parenting and just stay with the psychiatric framework that says, if you can get one parent or ward or anybody who is consistent and stable, then those kids will be okay. And so we divided this issue of parenting into financial and emotional. And what we found was that a lot of parents, they were good financially, but not emotionally. And another, and another set right, especially mothers were emotionally stable, but not financially. And, and, and by the time you were done working through this issue of parenting, you are finding that literally when you go into an area that has high levels of violence, and high levels of violence, by the way, internationally means a homicide rate exceeding 30 per 100,000, you would find these characteristics. And then we got to what we call a super variable training and, and, and education opportunities. And that's what, that's what hit us hard. Because what did we find using Educate Jamaica and just some preliminary materials that I plan to publish in the next couple of years? If a child was kept in school up until, up until they could do three subjects, and across the 117 countries, these would carry different names. In Jamaica, it's CSEC. In, in, in London, it is, of course, GSC, right? So they're GSC, right? So they are different names. But right across the board, we found that we used a platform or a baseline called dropping out of school by grade nine. And we found that if you completed school and were able to do three CXCs equivalent, which are not very useful, 
but at least you can move on to heart or go back the following year, right? You would be literally four times safer than in terms of risk when we do your risk level assessment than a, a, a boy who fell out at grade nine. We found that if your parents loved you enough and you had resources enough to do CAPE or A-levers or whatever the terms across the countries, you'll be 10 times safer. And if you are able to go to a, a, a college, a college, not, not, not even to do a degree, a college, even, even an associate degree or so forth, if you're able to move on from CAPE to a college to do a degree, you would be 84 times safer than a boy who dropped out at, 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 at grade nine. So we've, we, we've, we declared education as a super variable from all of that because in order for you to go to school, you'd have, you'd, have, you'd have had a sense of safety. You'd have had enough food because we found only 17% and we were able to even do assessments on their IQs and the other reasons. Only 17% of kids who were hungry actually were able to pass their exams. So in other words, having food, having supportive parents or our, our, our community, and, and of course, having a sense of safety, those are the kids who were remained in school. So when you took two groups and create a binary, those in school, those out of school, what you found was something very dramatic in terms of ontological security. When you, when you run the ontological security, when you run the ontological security index, which would have all of these, something very dramatic emerges. You find that the ones in school literally would respond to questions like, how do you feel, how committed do you feel to your country? You would find ranging from, so 90% would range from fear to very strong. When you take those that dropped out of school, right? When you took from, from fear to very strong, it amounted to 33%. The bulk of those that had dropped out of school by grade nine had glaringly poor ontological security. When you took the group that says, because we had a question that we normally ask and we've been asking around, and this was part of the original five questions. What do you plan to do in the next five years? Those who score high on ontological security, they would have a plan for the next five years. Those who had very poor ontological security. Actually, the bulk of them ask the researchers question like, why are you asking me about the next five years? You know, you go help me the next five years? Why, why are you looking at me asking a question about the next five? I look like I'm going to live for the next five years. So the, the young people were at such, such a loss that it became clear. So we created five tiers of young people from the various studies. The first group was called professional uh, repeat killers, right? Uh, or in Jamaica, we use the word shatters. The second group was, so those are persons who would have killed repeatedly. So they kill more than once and their data are very clear that they've killed more than once. The second group would have been high, high risk, and they would have been either killed once or they're a member of a gang, an active member of a gang and therefore the potential to kill is, is very high. And then we had medium, which meant that either stabbed or shot somebody or worse, stabbed or shot themselves. And that is in medium. And then we have low, meaning that the child is exposed to a lot of violence, like where I'm from in Savalamar growing up, but never committed any. And then we had shielded, where that person, male or female, uh, there's, a, there's an effort by the community and family for that person not even to see the violence. So they would hear like a shot down the road and go, you walk that way, right? There's chances that there's a dead body up there. I don't want to see any dead body and so forth. When we took the kids who were shielded and we assessed their, well, we gave them the index on ontological security, they all scored over 70 with an average of 78%. When you took those that were shutters that had killed repeatedly, they failed all four bars. Their food was insecure. They had poor supervision. They had nobody to take care of them. They were harmed by both the state and gunmen, right? And, and they had 
they had dropped out of school or had no sense of future. So in conclusion, ontological security has to be taken very seriously because one's psychological state, right, determines largely whether or not that person sees a value to his or her life and the value to other people's lives. I'll close by pointing out work that Professor Charles and myself were working on right now. And it's the matter that we've discovered that the people who, who are most likely to commit murder suicide are the ones who already had attempted suicide. So they attempted suicide and now they get into a relationship with somebody and that person violates and they say, well, you're coming to the grave with me because I'm already dead. When you transfer that kind of situation to the social realm, it becomes clear why when I work with young people who, who fail their ontological security test, they say to me, Doc, don't stay around me now because I'm already dead. The truth of the matter then is that every society, every government, the core of governance, the core of violence reduction has to be driven at the point of empowering young people, making sure they have a sense of tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Herbert. Uh, that was a great uh, opening um, innings. And that, of course, will be followed by our next speaker, who is Dr. Tracy and Coley. And um, Dr. Coley is a clinical psychologist and a full-time lecturer with the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work. And um, she teaches psychology in both the graduate and undergraduate programs. She has a strong interest, uh, research interest in the efficacy of psychotherapy, adolescent self-harm, and the interface between learning challenges and emotional dysfunction. I think with the opening that we just had, we expect the Dr. Coley to continue to sort of shed some light on the more aspects of ontological security. And I'm sure she's gonna address the issue of existential dread and angst. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Evening. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> it's very heartening um, for all of us as social workers, psychologists, um, sociologists, anyone in, in the mental health or, or a, an associated profession that is doing our best to try to create a space um, for thriving among young people, at-risk people, um, citizens of any country or citizens of the world, really. So it's always heartening um, to find that there are others who are as interested as we are. So thank you for coming. Now, there are a couple of things that I wanted to address um, and also tack on to um, what Dr. Gale said earlier that I think is, is really important to highlight. One of those issues is, as he said in the research that um, he was a part of. We understand as psychologists, it's been shown over and over again. Um, Maslow, one of the, the foundation researchers in psychology has talked about the fact that there is a hierarchy of needs. So there are things that people have to have in order to have this sense of, of safety, in order to have this internal sense of stability, in order to to coin um, or piggyback on what uh, Dr. Gale was saying, this sense of hope and tomorrow. And uh, for those of you who are not sure about Maslow and what the hierarchy of needs are, at the baseline of that is what we were talking about before, which is physiological needs. So <clears throat> um, shelter and food, et cetera. Um, after that, it's safety needs. Uh, how can you expect me to learn in a classroom? How do you, ex can you expect me to respect others or respect myself if no one, and I mean this on a, on a societal level and on a community level, and then in a, on a family level, if no one cares about my basic needs, if no one cares that I'm going to school hungry, if no one cares that my community is unsafe, if no one cares that I have nowhere to live. 
And then once those needs are met, then you find that um, an individual's ability to look beyond themselves and um, engage in activities that would reflect love and connection and care for community and care for family, that natural naturally grows because they would have received an example of that coming up with the provision of, of their basic needs, whether by family, community, or um, society, so government, for example. And then once that's there, the next need um, is self-esteem. At that point, when you start to feel an attachment to something larger than yourself, who you are, um, your belief in who you are, um, your desire to extend or to understand who you are um, grows because there's now a solid foundation. And once that's in place, then you find that people start striving to try to be their best selves. So when the baseline is threatened um, and we maintain this idea that um, individuals who are threatened or at risk should be able to achieve or should be able to, to perform in community and in society the way that we as a group um, expect, then what we're doing is that we're setting ourselves up as a society and community um, for failure and we're setting young people up um, as well. So we have a lot of really interesting speakers um, this evening who are gonna add different perspectives to this idea of what I'm going to refer to as, as internal safety or internal security. Um, it's a multi-layered issue. Uh, just over the past week, um, I've heard news reports about um, one student slapping um, a teacher in the face. Um, and then when the news reporter got into more detail, what they discovered is that the teacher was actually trying to separate um, a fight between two male students. And for that, she was unfortunately assaulted. And the wave of commentary was about um, this student and the violence and the discussion ended up being centered around, well, should we create um, a separate place for this student? Should we pull this student out should we follow the Trinidad model and, you know, force this child into the army? Should we, um, you know, have some sort of separate building where these children will be housed who are considered uncontrollable? Um, you know, what do we do? And I was, as I was listening to the report, I mean, naturally, I'm a psychologist, but also a parent. Um, and I'm also a teacher, so I don't want to be assaulted in any of my classes. Um, my focus though was different. My focus was on this teacher who is working in a, in a school where, um, where violence is more, is something that, that they would see happening on a fairly regular basis. And yet this teacher intervened. Um, and I would imagine that somewhere in the back or the recesses of that teacher's mind, there was a possibility of uh, a negative outcome, but the teacher still intervened. That is the seed of hope. And so am I gonna focus my attention 100% on this child who um, got into this um, issue or got into this argument, fight, and totally ignore on the other side, this teacher who intervened, or am I going to look at both situations and say, how can we get more of this that the teacher showed and implant that into this young person? Um, and I think that's a part of the challenge that we had. We have as a society, as a nation, as a world right now. When you look at, at states like Israel and Palestine and countless African nations, that are um, embroiled in, in warfare. Um, we focus, we tend to focus on, on the violence that's taking place. But within those communities, people are living and people are thriving and people are being good to each other. 
how come? What's the difference? Um, and focus, in my opinion, is a part of that difference. What it is that we choose to focus on. So we can have an idea that says um, it's the government that needs to intervene. And it's the government that has to provide safety and security. And I'm in agreement. The government has a responsibility to do that. But do we then hold our breath and say, until that is done, then we don't, we can't have hope. We can't encourage young people. We can't save um, this group of at-risk um, young people. Or I guess we could, we could build a facility and put them in there and wait until safety is less of an issue and then release them at that time. Um, it isn't a, a, a viable solution. We can't hold our breath. And so if we're not gonna hold our breath and wait, then what are we going to do? So, you know, there's no need to reinvent any wheels. You know, lots of nations have come up with different solutions. You have therapeutic schools that requires a lot of money. They're great, but it requires a lot of investment. Um, you have uh, putting focus on, on strengthening the family unit, which I also think is <clears throat> an important solution. But again, <clears throat> that requires this outside force, this outside intervention. <clears throat> um, and unfortunately, we've had several of those kinds of programs here in Jamaica. But unfortunately, um, there's no consistency in terms of how it is that we approach uh, these various interventions. So I think a part of the focus that we have to have is on the, on the young people themselves. What can we do? Um, and so this is more of a psychological type of intervention. What can we do as psychologists that would help, that could possibly help um, these young people who are exposed to violence, who are exposed to neglect, who are exposed to um, unthinkable things, how can we make it so that rather than being the exception, so we all know stories of, of people who come, come out of um, you know, violent communities and they've made good, you know, so they're doing well and they have degrees and they're at med school and they're professors. Um, we all know those stories and we all know a couple of those people. We have those students in our classrooms here at the university. But it feels like it's the exception. Um, I'm not sure. I think more of that is happening than we actually realize. And if you talk to these young people, a lot of what they will tell you in terms of how it is that they made it out, in addition to family structures, strong family structures, in addition to parents who did everything that they could to try to shield them, um, they also were taught to focus on the right things. Um, so rather than focusing on the fact that they were poor, their parents focused on, helped them to focus on the fact that they were being given an opportunity in an education. And as a result of that, um, they had, <laughs> they would have an opportunity, a vehicle in which to improve themselves. Um, our internal dialogue can affect how it is that we view ourselves and how it is that we view our opportunities. Um, I don't want to oversimplify uh, the situation. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be fixed on a physical level. And by no means am I ignoring that. What I'm saying is, that there's a lot that we can do on an individual level as well. Helping um, young people to have a sense of hope, a sense of tomorrow is important because that's a part of what's going to create a shield around them. And so even though there's chaos going on on the outside that we may not be able to control in the short term, if they can control the internal chaos that comes from feeling like there is nothing that they can do to change their circumstances, then I think that we would have done a lot in terms of moving them towards a different place, in terms of moving them to a place where an intervention um, on that level becomes consistent 
and it becomes stable and it's positive and it has the potential to spread. Because if I see my friend doing something and moving out of my community, um, <clears throat> my at-risk community, and doing well for herself, I'm going to want to know how she did that. And I'm going to mirror that and try to follow that pattern um, if I think I can. And so that I think is a part of, of the solution that we have to talk about on a micro level and on a macro level um, if we're going to all be a part of the solution, um, especially as we're talking about uh, creating this sense of internal safety in the midst of chaos. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coley. Uh, so we started off with a sort of a sociological, anthropological um, uh, discussion. We took a, uh, the discussion towards the psychological, clinical psychological um, approach. And we are now going to hear from the international relations perspective. Um, that leads us to our next speaker, Ambassador Curtis Ward, many of you uh, would have read his writings in the Gleaner and um, he has a podcast, uh, those of you who follow his podcast. Um, but he's a very distinguished um, public servant, Jamaican public servant. Uh, he's a former ambassador of Jamaica to the United Nations. He spent two years on this UN Security Council He's an attorney at law and an international consultant specializing in national and international security law and policy, <clears throat> counterterrorism, legal and operational international sanctions, um, rule of law, governance, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very distinguished um, son of the soil. Um, and we are now going to turn to him to hear more about the, the nation state aspect of ontological security, because even though it was defined initially in terms of the self, there's a sense in which it is also, the concept is, is also deployed in the discussion of the nation state. So over to you, um, Ambassador Ward. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure being here. The subject of this seminar Ontological Security, Gender, Economics, and International Relations is very intriguing and multifaceted. I assume I was asked to participate as a moderator just stated because of my international relations and security background. In which case, I will try to address the nexus between ontological security and Jamaica's conduct of international relations and confidence in an independent foreign policy. I put this in the context of our confidence in self and our respect for and adherence to international law and norms which place all states on an equal plane. International law provides protection for small states against the powerful who might wish to exercise power indiscriminately. And international law provides the basis for the conduct of international relations among all states. Professor J. L. Briarly, who is sometimes referred to as the father of international law and relations, in his classic book, Law of Nations, first published in 1928, and now in its eighth edition, on the conduct of international relations in a law-based system, stated International law is performing a useful and indeed a necessary function in international life, in enabling states to carry out their day-to-day -day intercourse 
along orderly and predictable lines. There are contrasting strengths and weaknesses, great disparities in economic and military capabilities, large and small countries, island states and contiguous states, varying political interests, geopolitical and security considerations, and a plethora of factors and challenges that affect how each government develops and maintains its international and bilateral relations. Jamaica's conduct of international relations takes place within this complex environment. And it is within this context that Jamaica is often punching above its weight. We often refer to our country, Jamaica, as we little what we tell our. This is a mindset rather than a reality. We do not have military capabilities to defend the country against a hostile force. <clears throat> we cannot protect our maritime space from illicit trafficking in drugs and guns. Our security is constantly under threat and we depend on our alliances to help protect us. <laughs> we had grown accustomed to hearing Jamaica punches above its weight. Some may even have meant Jamaica is uppity. This was based on our ability as a small country to be proactive on important issues and being an effective voice on the right side of history as we defended certain core principles in our bilateral and international relations. This was our reality. But this was not by happenstance. This behavior is based on confidence in who we have chosen to be as a nation. It was Jamaica's national hero, Norman Manley, who was first to lead the international community in efforts to isolate apartheid South Africa. This bold step was a landmark decision which emboldened other countries and inspired succeeding Jamaican governments to carve out a world leading role in the anti-apartheid movement, human rights advocacy, and in the advocacy for the freedoms of people under colonial and other forms of oppression, domination and occupation, and rights to self-determination for all peoples under the yoke of a superior and occupying power, for equity and fairness in the international trade and economic systems, and for reform of international financial institutions. We proved that a small country like Jamaica can be a leader in resolving difficult issues and can be effective, reliable, and trusted partner in international affairs. Global respect for Jamaica earned our country economic rewards, accolades, and recognition. It opened doors for Jamaicans to serve in international organizations and institutions. Our past experiences and performances grew out of our own mindset and confidence in ourselves as Jamaicans. We believed in the phrase, we little but we tell her, and we acted accordingly. It was not without risk, but we took them as in most activities in the normal affairs of a country, we do not limit ourselves to our size and limited resources. We have acted with confidence. We had a moral compass and we had integrity. 
Thus, Jamaican governments in the past were able to influence the conduct of international relations and decision making on a plethora of critical global issues. In multilateral forum, we led on issues related to human security, on equity, equality, and justice. We led on gender equity and the protection of women and children. We led on issues of peace and security. And we were very impactful during our two-year term as member of the UN Security Council at the beginning of this century. Former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson memorialized our effectiveness in his book, My Political Journey. He said, in our most recent tenure on the UN Security Council, shrewd commentators marveled at how a country with such a small delegation could have been as effective in the Council's deliberations during 2000-2001. As to the Security Council's action against terrorism in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 attacks, Mr. Patterson stated, and I quote, Jamaica's dominance among non-permanent members of the Security Council on these issues established new precedents and created new dynamics in the Council vis-a-vis -vis permanent and non-permanent members. And that during Jamaica's membership on the Security Council are principled and steadfast sometimes uncompromising defense of justice, gender equity, human rights, the right to self-determination, and the end to impunity embolden other non-permanent members to stand up. We were secure in our confidence. I can attest to that record. It was my personal experience while representing Jamaica on the UN Security Council during those two years. Some significant historical developments in the Americas were highly influenced by the boldness of Jamaica's leaders in the 1970s. We defied the power to the North and embraced Cuba as a part of our Caribbean family. We robustly advocated for protection of human rights in Chile during the brutal Pinochet regime. We were in the forefront of efforts to return Panama's sovereignty over the Panama Canal. And we led in defense of the integrity of the territorial integrity. <clears throat> Our beliefs removing barriers to that country's path to independence. We also stood in defiance of economic threats from the United States in strident support of Southern Africans in their struggle for freedom. As Jamaicans, we were confident in our defense of what was right, and we were prepared to suffer the consequences of our moral convictions. International respect for our country <laughs> was because of the integrity and coherence of our foreign policy and our fearless conduct of international relations. We never kowtowed to powerful countries, and we did not shun difficult issues. We conducted international relations on our feet, not on our knees. It's best to be erect and correct. As a small nation, 
our achievements in sports and cultural expressions in music and our scholarship are natural extensions of the paradigm of confidence in self that we, as Jamaicans, have embraced. We have shown that we are not bound by the expectations of the international community. Thus, as a nation, Jamaica, its people at home and in the diaspora, is responsible to this and succeeding generations to live up to and reclaim the standards we have set in the past. Our political leaders must become aware of Jamaica's history, of our ontological security relating to our conduct of international relations. Let's be frank. Governments of Jamaica have had varying degrees of commitment to the core principles of our foreign policy. The public too often seems unperturbed. Those who are enriched to have otherwise benefited and continue to benefit from our past conduct of international relations do not seem to appreciate how and why our conduct of international relations has helped pave the way to their enrichment. There is an international relations context for the much talked about brand Jamaica. But recently, there has been an erosion of a robust defense of long-held principles. There are inconsistencies, some say incompetences, and a profound lack of appreciation for our past foreign policy successes. We have a history, an international relations history, that is the envy of countries far better endowed and with financial human and financial resources. But we are a unique people with a unique history, culture, and DNA. Friends, I'm old enough to recall that the history taught to me in high school proved to be lies created to shape our young minds in believing in the superiority of the imperial colonizers and former enslavers of our forefathers. We were dependent on them for our security, not on ourselves. We were not allowed to question authority or motive, yet we managed to escape that orthodoxy and were able to believe that we little but we tell our and to develop a reputation of country above our weight internationally. How much latitude should students have to question the orthodoxy of what they're taught? Our personal, social, and cultural experiences limiting factors in who they can become? Or should they believe that despite their personal experiences, there's no limit to what they can achieve because of our mindset that we little but we tell our Our foreign policy cannot be based merely on personal gratification or personal rewards. It never used to be, perhaps because we were mostly descendants of former enslaved and colonized persons. We saw humanity through different lenses. We placed humanity at the center of our practice of international relations. We may be Harry Belafonte's island in the sun, 
but you are not alone in this world. And no man is an island. The strength of our foreign policy and our international relationships were based on certain precepts which we must embrace at the present. Our advocacy today and tomorrow is as relevant as it was yesterday. There is still slavery and human bondage, and the scourge of human trafficking is widespread. Human rights are denied to millions around the world. With discrimination based on race, class, ethnicity, gender, religion, and sexual orientation, there are war crimes and genocide and crimes against humanity occurring every day. There is no true freedom for us unless all of humanity has the freedoms we desire for ourselves. Freedom from war, freedom from fear, freedom from bondage and oppression. Fanilu Hema the great American civil rights campaigner said, nobody is free until everybody is free. The same applies to justice for all, and not just for Jamaicans. Just injustice proliferates around the world. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Jamaica has been, and again can be a catalyst for change on the international stage. Mahatma Gandhi suggested, we must be the change we want to see. But, but that change begins at home, in Jamaica, and with us. Our national hero, Marcus Masai Garvey, admonished us that none but ourselves can free our minds. We have developed that culture of free thinking and expressions. Sometimes we displease some by the principles we expose, but we are endowed with the spirit of our ancestors and firm belief that we little what we tell them. We must revisit those basic values which guided the conduct of our international relations and the conduct of each other, one with the other. Those values are part of our ontological DNA. Those are standards by which we have defined ourselves, standards underpinned by the confidence in our firm belief that we little but we follow. Ladies and gentlemen, many countries, big and small, have held Jamaica in very high regard and sought the advice and counsel and our support on many difficult international issues. It now seems we have forgotten who we are as Jamaican, we must recognize that we have achieved, that what we have achieved, we can do again, even if it means a renaissance in the way we see ourselves and a recalibration of our moral compass and our political will, how we perceive our ontological security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ward. Um, we can hear from both the substance of your delivery and the passion with which you have indeed delivered that years of experience um, have uh, been shown in your presentation and indeed in the thoughts that you've expressed. I expect that following this discussion, we will have quite an animated um, set of questions and discussions to follow. Thank you again, Ambassador Ward. 
Our next speaker is a man well known to, uh, I assume all of us, certainly I've known him for many, many years, um, Ralston Hyman, who is one of Jamaica's, the Caribbean and the world's leading financial analysts. And um, he has been a financial analyst um, for 35 years, right, Ralston? And um, he's had a lot of international experience, local and international experience in the area of micro, microeconomics, finance, and statistics. And um, having worked with the IMF and the IDB, et cetera. Uh, so he brings to the table a wealth of experience. I should also point out, Ralston, that you used to teach in the econ economics department here many, many years back, before some of the, those in the back were even born. <laughs> um, but he continues with his um, broadcasting career on radio, where he talks about uh, a number of issues related to the economy. He's a very forthright person. He um, doesn't uh, pull punches, takes no prisoners. So Ralston, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much, Herbs, for inviting me today. It's really a pleasure and a blessing because we believe in the public domain that the University of the West Indies, particularly the Department of Economics, has lost its way. We see a whole lot of intellectual flaccidity coming out of the Department of Economics these days. So we believe that you know it's very important to be here today, Herbs. So give thanks for you to invite me. Remember the days when we had people like Mikey Witter, uh, Claremont Curtin, Professor Francis, and those people, Ian, Mark Figaro, we used to have all of these discussions about national affairs. We do not see that coming out of the university again in terms of what is happening at the macro level. So as I've said, Anthony gave us defined um, ontological security as a stable mental state derived from a sense of continuity in regard to events in one's life sense of order and continuity in regard to individual experiences. Now, if you go in any community today, right across Jamaica, the refrain that you hear from the people is that no better no day. Every man I drink rum and boom and I spoke split. No man I believe in it tomorrow. Man does go too. So there's no ontological security from an economic standpoint. So John Maynard Keynes was a foremost authority when it comes to ontological security in terms of economics. He contended that the primary objective of macroeconomic policy is to promote the highest levels of employment possible, price stability, and social equity. Now we're going to use these slides to demonstrate that none of these things are being achieved in Jamaica, and that is why the people feel as if no better no day, and you know, them not really response, and you have all of this disorder taking place. So Let's start with employment first. Now, we hear all the numbers. People are telling that the unemployment rate is the lowest ever, 4.5%. That was July of 2023. These numbers are irrefutable. So let us tell, tell it straight. So starting tell us that the number of persons in the labor force as of July 2023 was 1.377 million persons. The number of persons employed of July 2023, 1.315 million. The unemployment rate, 4.5%. The labor participation rate mean the number of persons of working age who are seeking work, 65.6%. The number of persons unemployed, 62,200. The number of persons outside of the labor force, people who are not looking for no work, 722,800. And they are not looking for no work for various reasons. So you have some going to school, some are retired, some man said, boy, I can't deal with the contract business, I can't deal with the low wages and all of that. Now, if you look at where the jobs were created, the largest increase in employment took place in what we call elementary occupations. So there were 173,800 persons employed in this group in July of 2023. 
that was an increase of 23,500. The number of persons employed as service workers, shop and market workers, people working in Mr. Chin, Mona us upon the corner, 24,500 compared to 290,000 in July of 2022. So you see where the jobs are being created. Those jobs do not provide any ontological security. Man paid done before him got to work, him have to borrow money for go back to work and all of them things. You follow me? <laughs> there are 142,000 persons working as clerks. Again, low wages compared to 132,000 in 2022. There are 173,400 persons employed in the agricultural sector. Again, low wages, low technology, computer 129,900 in 2022. There are 150,800 persons employed in the real estate and other business services sector. So we talk about the money we work at BPO. So you leave university degree, you got BPO, you work for 80,000 a month and, and I'm thinking you can't go back to you can't do not, right? Right. The number of persons employed in the construction and installation sector were was 130,300 compared with 121,400. So I'm gonna work and I might get 3,000 a day and 2,500 a day. No union, no training, no anything. Yeah, man, that's a hustle, right? Now, what we're seeing is that although we have the lowest unemployment rate ever, output per man is falling, as John Basically I call it, diminishing marginal productivity. So you have more man I work, but you get less output because of the lack of training, lack of education, Private sector not investing in technology, yeah, not a lot of investments, poor investments in infrastructure and all of those things. Again, inflation. So although the wages are low, inflation is eating away your money. So although they told us inflation climbed by 0.8% in October, but is down to 5.1% on a point-to-point -point basis, that's from October to October. Remember, prices do not stop increasing. Is that the rate of increase is decelerating? So you are building up. So inflation was X last year. When it got down, it means that the prices are falling. It means that the prices are just increasing at a slower pace. So the people money can't buy nothing. So although you're working, people can't buy nothing, right? Governor says that we could see inflation spiking in December. Again, problem with agriculture, drought. Food is 35% of the weights in the inflation basket. So when you got a market, everything pumpkin, everything costs more. So your money buy less, right? So that is ravaging the real wages of the workers. So wages are already low in nominal terms, but higher prices ravage what you can buy with the low wages. That doesn't give ontological security, right? Now, macroeconomic policy in Jamaica is more directed at debt reduction rather than economic growth and expansion. So the key variable that we hear, you hear the government talking about the primary surplus. So Nigel Clark is running a primary surplus. This is April to September of uh, 56.2 billion when the amount needed was 43.67 billion. Now the primary surplus is the amount of money that is accumulated and available to service the debt. So he's paying down the debt faster than expected in order to get ratings from S&P and Moody's and all of those things, while at the same time under investing in infrastructure and basic social services such as education, healthcare, solid waste management, so you see all of the garbage on the street, all those things don't provide ontological security. Now, what we're also seeing is that we're going back after this rapid recovery from COVID-19, we're going back to the annual average growth rate of 1% because policy is more focused on debt reduction rather than growth. So as Professor Samuel Sunderman, you see on the right of the screen from MIT and Harvard contending, what we're developing, what we call a wasteful output gap. So when you go and you see all of these youths sitting on the street, drinking rum and boom, burning weed, all of these rundown communities, all of those factories on Spanish Town Road that are closed down, that is what we call the wasteful output gap. And that also leads to more criminality and more antisocial behavior. That is there, so you can't deal with those things. So again, it tells you about the weakening ontological security from an economic standpoint. Again, they tell you that we're digitalizing the system, we're paying all the money, your salaries, you get the small salary, you have to go to the bank, you have to go to the ATM machine. But when you check out most of the ATM machine, them not work. And Mr. Biles not do anything about it, although he's a supervisor of the deposit taking institutions. He's not doing anything about it. So we see the high banking fees, the poor service, people walking up, driving from Papine to Ligani just to get some money from an ATM machine. And Mr. Biles is doing anything about it, and the banks are making super profits. Again, that does not lead to ontological security from an economic standpoint. Transportation system, ramshackle transportation system. Stifling productivity is like a middle passage experience. JUTC is expected to lose 14 billion this year, but Mr. Clark says reducing the fares at the same time as an election ploy. 
those losses are going to go to 16 billion in two years' time. Now, the JUT, the 16 billion that JUTC is losing could have been transferred to putting more youth in primary school, as, as Herb said, could have been transferred to fixing some of the roads and all of those things. So what we should have been doing is to make the JUTC more efficient rather than using the JUT to, JUTC to try and win an election. So people wait a long time because they only have 170 buses, all of those things, not, no ontological security. So you work for the whole day, and you have to stand up at the bus stop for two hours to get a bus and all of things. Those things do not lead to ontological security. And we have the indiscipline with the taxi drivers at the same time. So, yeah, poor transportation system. You look at the road network, poor road network. So you look at the country's road network, particularly rural roads in a deplorable state, again, because the objective of policy is to pay down the debt faster rather than invest in infrastructure. So you see the bad roads, yeah, affect agriculture, make food prices higher, make agriculture inefficient. The urban roads are poor and congested. So you take two hours to move from point A to point B. All those things do not facilitate productivity and higher wages because higher wages are a function of productivity. So all those things are a serious problem. Poor drainage on the road, frequent flooding as you get liquor in, the whole road flood, flood out, all of those things. Yeah, so all these things, the bad roads contribute to road crashes and all of those things with high socioeconomic costs to the people, not ontological security. Look at the healthcare system again, not spending enough on healthcare, not paying the doctors well, not paying the nurses well, so they are migrating. So we see Cornwall Regional started at $2 billion, it's now $16 billion, and we now hear that it will be completed in 2026. That's another $4 billion, no ontological security, because all of that money could have been used to invest in education and other things. Not enough doctors in the system. The doctors and the nurses, they are migrating because of poor remuneration, working conditions, the disrespect that they get from the Minister of Finance, all of those things. Inadequate equipment. The minister says only 48% of the equipment in the hospital system is maintained. So all of those problems, long appointment dates, by the time you get to see the doctor, you're dead. Yep, no ontological security. Again, insufficient investments in education. Education system suffering from inadequate investments, particularly in the tier four schools. So we name the schools around say, there are secondary schools, there are high schools. One of the good things that we saw coming out of the Manning Cup is that we have Mona and we have Hyden, not JC and KC. So it tells us that if those schools get more resources, then they can perform better. So we need to resource those schools better, right? Teachers are migrating again because of the poor remuneration, working conditions, disrespect that they get from the ministry, inadequate investments in plant and equipment. Some 37 schools are still on the shift system, high teacher-student ratio, increase in violence against teachers, as, as well as against fellow students. No ontological security. Solid waste management, terrible, yeah? Insufficient trucks, poor management, no proper landfill, no budgetary priority because the minister told us that he would be buying 200 trucks. Then he said that because of COVID-19, he couldn't buy the trucks. Then he bought 100. Then we are here now that because of the procurement rules, we can't get the other 100 trucks. So we have to live with all of this thing. Again, no ontological security. The trade deficit still widening. Yeah. For the first seven months of this year, Jamaica, imported 4.439 billion in merchandise goods, that's physical goods. Exported only 1.227 billion, so it's four to one. And it tells us about the weakness in our productivity, say, in, in our, our real sector, the lack of productivity, lack of investments in research and development, lack of investments in new technology and all of those things. Now, this comes on the back of a deficit of $5.83 billion last year when we imported 7.73 billion and exported only 1.901 billion. Now, again, as Professor Ward told you, this now increases our dependence on remittance flows, tourism, FDI flows, and that is why our foreign policy is so weak. We are not producing internally, so we have to be bowing, yeah, in order to secure assistance. Right. Yeah, so the minister tells us that tourism is booming. He tells us that there are some one million seats coming out of the USA for the winter tourism season. That was a big headline in the Greener today. But the retention from the tourism sector is only one forty-one cents per US dollar. So after every dollar that the tourists spend, only forty-one cents stays in Jamaica. There's a low level of integration between the tourism sector, the agricultural sector, the manufacturing sector, and the cultural sectors. So we saw for the first seven months, imports of food and consumer goods were over a billion dollars, one point one billion dollars. So rather than integrate the tourism sector with the agricultural sector, the manufacturing sector, so that we can benefit more. 
We are all about these fancy numbers, but in terms of its impact on the economy, very limited. So we see most of our workers doing low skill, low paying jobs in the tourism sector. We see the whole thing about squatting because there are no housing development for the people who are moving from one parish to the other parish to benefit from the expansion in tourism. So it facilitates squatting. Squatting goes with criminality, ontological insecurity, and all of those things. We now see that our people have limited access to our own beaches. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we're telling you that with all you're hearing about these macro numbers, they are not facilitating economic ontological security of our people. So these are some of the things that we need to be thinking about. And we need to hear the Department of Economics at the university about these things. We are not hearing a lot from them in relation to these things. What we are getting is a kind of PR thing where they support everything that the government says. And this is contrary to in the 1980s when people like Ian, Mike Witta, uh, Clement Curtin, Professor Francis, Professor Gervon were here. Yeah. So that's my small presentation today about the lack of economic security in terms, ontological security in terms of the economy in Jamaica today. Okay, so I see what I told you, it's right in your face. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ralston. Um, and um, ladies and gentlemen, we have our final presentation uh, for this panel. And the person who will be making this presentation is no other than um, Professor um, Christopher Charles. He is a political psychologist. Um, he's in the Department of Government, someone who's published and re researched and published extensively in the area of sports. And um, he also has also done work with, in relation to electoral behavior. Overall, he's a psychologist, a political scientist, and overall a social scientist who has um, much to say on this topic. And I suspect um, he will be speaking to the issue of sports, right? Yes. Okay, give him a, a warm round. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're looking at ontological security and sports. I'm Christopher Childs from the Department of Government. So I'll explain how playing a sport can provide ontological security and how playing a sport can undermine ontological security and then how to provide ongoing support for ontological security through sports. So. R.D. Leng came up with the initial formulation, which he referred to as, as a continuous person who enjoys a stable and whole existence in objective reality. But it was Anthony Giddens in more recent time who stated that it is a person's fundamental sense of safety in the world and includes a basic trust of other people. And I'm moving on because that's the basic definition. Um, and you have heard a lot about ontological security from the previous presenters. So when I'm conceptualizing ontological security in terms of sports, I took a particular perspective, the social identity approach. And the perspective here is informed by Sartre, Sartre's notion that there is no self without the other. And who we are is based on our connection with others. And we are social beings, although we still have our individual or personal identities. Social identity here suggests that people identify with social groups which they share common values and attributes. People identify with such groups based on religion, occupation, politics, ethnicity, skin color, race, nationality, gender, religion, um, sexuality, societal issues, sports, and so on. And important here is the issue of multiple social identities, because there is a misinformed notion in this faculty that we all, we all should have one identity, which is a racial identity, and it's the only thing that matters. And people function in a range of self, and you can not, you cannot, um, 
put emphasis or define yourself in one way, but you live a wholesome life just the same. And it is this multiple social identity that is very important because you'll find, as, as I go on to other slides, that people who, in their sense of self, they rely less on other attachments um, to, to, to varying groups and have one main primary social entity that is uh, sacred. These are the people who, when they hold this one sense of self, if it's threatened, they will destroy everything else. So this is very important in terms of the solutions when I get to the end. So people use their attachments Great, thank you. People use their attachment to these varying groups to define themselves that gives coherence, purpose, and meaning to their lives. So if you're religious, you internalize your religiosity and you define yourself based on it, and you attach yourself to religious people within your particular religion. If, if, if you're a psychologist or a medical doctor, an anthropologist, you so define yourself in terms of your, your, your occupation, profession, and you feel attached to other anthropologists. And you, you use that attachment to define um, your sense of self. So we have multiple social identities, not just one. And people will determine which social identity they give prominence to. So no one can tell you that you must have this one. It doesn't make sense. Right, it goes against every decades of um, psychological science. So, uh, um, the, the titles for my uh, I, well, I'm not seeing it. I hope you're seeing it. Oh, still not seeing it. Okay. Um, so, looking at sports. Um, so, what is sports actually? It's, it's actually an organized. Um, recreational routine that humankind we have developed over millennia. So it is divided in individual and team sports, as well as in terms of um, the competitive nature and commercialization in terms of um, amateur sports, as well as professional sports. So many people in playing a sport, internalize the sport, and attach themselves to others who play this sport, which gives meaning, purpose, and coherence to their lives. So they develop a sport identity. For example, I'm a footballer, I'm a cricketer. And this sports participation in terms of social identity allow these persons to develop trust with like-minded others and maintain a sense of psychological well-being. We know of many examples in Jamaica. We are young men who play cricket and football. It is that attachment to that team, why they have given up the gun, why they have remained on what we like to call in religious Jamaica, the straight and narrow. So sports, in terms of developing a, a particular sport identity, is life-saving or it, 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 it provides a sense of self with sufficient attachment to others who play that sport at the institutions into school, to colleges, uh, to communities, that sense of safety, um, sports provide that, you know, and enhancing psychological well-being. It's, it's not moving, is the technician here? So just bear with us, um, we have another technical glitch. Um, the slides are not moving. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, we know that in Jamaica, we are very good. We're, we're world-class in terms of athletics. We're world class in terms of netball, and we're we're becoming world class in terms of football, 
And so we are very proud. And, and, and in terms of um, Jamaica's national identity, that sense of self where you feel safe and secure, you're proud to be Jamaican, you feel attached to other Jamaicans. Our stellar performance consistently across the kitchen in these sports give us a strong sense of self and we feel safe and secure and feel attached to Jamaica. That by itself, while important, is insufficient given the high levels of violence in the country. And if you look at sports and security, insecurity, you, you, you'll realize that um, at least in individual events, I mean, I'm using the American term sports persons, it might sound strange to um, many of you, but in America, it's, it is a legitimate word, maybe not elsewhere. Um, so, so athletes, uh, persons who participate in individual events, they are less likely to be aggressive than their counterparts in team sports. The most you, you will witness is that at least in individual events, they may quarrel or disagree with an umpire or say something rude um, to, 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 the, to the other person they're, they're competing with. Most of the aggression and violence come from team sports on occasion fights, um, you know, where team, the members of one team, they'll fight um, opposing team members or they'll try to bully the referee. And in a few instances, they'll attack um, referees and so on. And fans, they riot, invade the pitch and violently attack rival supporters. And I think Herbert, during his studies, would have witnessed um, many of these events. So this is from the Independent in the UK. <laughs> Football related arrests rocket amid rise in violent disorder. Right? Right? And, <laughs> and this is from 2022, right? Last year. <laughs> and what, right? So, so violence in sports, not unique to any particular place. And we have some very big examples elsewhere, like in Europe in this case. Another one from the Independent, West Ham fan kills friend of 14 years with one punch after defeat to Arsenal. So violence, um, despite the benefits of sports, you know, depending on how one defines oneself and how one uses sports and how one sees the world in terms of connection with other institutions and groups one can become violent. NHL in North America, uh, you know, Montreal Canadiens, fans drive after Stanley Cup finals, bird, they smash police car and so on. And they're known when some of these NHL teams win, that is all right. In terms of the local situation, the Manning Cup in this case, last year, five players sent off in Campadon up in clash, right, for, for, for violent behavior. And I, as a child, was traumatized in 1980. I was a football fanatic who went to the stadium in 1980 when Arnett Gardens and Tivoli was playing. And buses were coming saying um, power and shower. But even with that indication while walking up Ottawa Drive, I, I still led into the stadium until a goal was scored and it was disallowed and gunshots started to fire. And then I ran out of the stadium with other people and the police thought I had a gun and they ran me down as a kid uh, to use my, my, my agility to escape over the wall into Nannyville. So during that time and in the 80s, some major league games from teams representing violent communities, they will play that up our camp, right? We're no longer there, <laughs> thankfully. So we have seen instances, despite the fact that we have done so well in sports, and we have seen how sports, from all the evidence we have, have um, saved a lot of young men, young women, from violence and protected them because they are the stars of the community and they need to be protected, and, and they are connected to um, important people, important groups and institutions. We have seen it, but we also see where the sports can lead to um, problems. And the reasons for the insecurity 
let me go to, I'm looking for my oh, multiple social identities um, point, but let me, let me start. Where you have these kinds of situation where you have a lot of violence, usually the persons involved in the violence is usually alienated from the, from the main institution. They're alienated from the establishment in the society or established institutions, and, they, and there's a lack of trust for important societal institutions, and there's an absence of multiple social identity. More often, the sport identity is the only thing that you have that is meaningful in their lives. And so it's the only thing they have. And when they feel threatened through ridicule, through rival fans cheering or through a loss, or they feel that they are cheated, they can become violent. So it is always important to anchor yourselves in multiple identities. So this is very important. So there's a, an absence of multiple social identities, one of the reasons for um, the insecurity or the lack of ontological security. So the point here is there's one sacred primary identity where the person ignores important attachment to other social groups and institutions because they don't trust these groups. And in the Jamaican case, sometimes what we have seen, as in the example that I gave in 1980 between Arnett Gardens, um, football team and the Tivoli Gardens football team. In, in a tribalized society where electoral competition heightens one's identity, what you find is that people will fuse the two identities where your sport identity becomes your political identity and vice versa. And then, you know, you fuse it. So just one identity. And also reasons for insecurity, um, team sports, they are contact sports, and like individual sports, they're very competitive, but in individual sports, you are separated. And the context of you know, people tackling, you know, bumping, saying things to you, and so on, hellboying, you know, hitching you with the ball, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, or, 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 or in the case of football, um, what they consider an unfair tackle or that referee is unfair or the crowd is being disrespectful and threatening, it can lead to a lot of problems. So the violence um, in terms of team sports are more likely to happen with footballers from upgraded high schools, schools, with schools and major and Premier League teams from high violence communities. And interestingly here, um, there's a popular strategy in Jamaica in trying to reduce violence um, in, in, in warring communities is to have a peace match, a football match, where the teams representing warring communities play against each other for unity. So if you, if you look at classic um, sectors like Sharif in terms of group identities, once you put people in groups, and, and, you, and you make them competitive, they're gonna take on a group identity and become aggressive. So the peace match reinforces the division between the communities. And there's a better way which, which I'll end with, is that the two communities, you could um, uh, create a team from both communities and they go around the country playing other teams. They're working towards a common goal, all right. So my final slide, um, sports for ontological security, promote multiple social identities with pro-social values. So you're not anchored in any one identity. You have multiple social identities and they're all meaningful. You can either integrate them or, 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 create, or create an hierarchy of these identities. But you'd always have one that is your favorite, right? You can use sports to teach life skills, team cohesion, that um, a group is not a team, and there's a common goal that you're working towards, right? Um, or you manage yourself, working together, cooperation, covering for someone, working together. All these things are important, and you can use sports, right? And, and this notion comes from 
Dr. Um, Don Davis, who calls himself Iman Black, he argues that all coaches should be trained as teachers because you can use different sports to teach life skills. Also, reduce alienation in terms of how you treat young people, the marginalized young people in a city, and there's a lack of trust um, for important situation in the country. Um, LAPOP survey every two years shows this, that there's a declining, there's declining trust among um, for, uh, Jamaicans have declining trust in relation to institutions. Um, so you have to reduce the nation, the and the lack of trust for these institutions among youth and sports persons. And finally, teams from war in schools or communities, you have to create a combined team and play other schools. You have to get them to work towards a common goal. And if you want to reduce it, you also get those communities to, to do projects together in the country, right? Change the narrative, right? And so, there, so these t schools that are, are competing and are at odds violently and, and, and schools and communities, you can get them to do not just form a combined team and play others, but to do um, common community work in other parts of the country. And so you will achieve ontological uh, security through sports. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Charles. So ladies and gentlemen, we have been treated to um, an evening, afternoon and evening of uh, some very provocative uh, discussions about surrounding the notion of ontological security. We started um, out by hearing the work um, by some with some definitional aspects, conceptual issues um, by Herbert Gill and um, talking about some of his work with groups and gangs, etc. Then we heard um, about the psychological, specific psych psychological and clinical aspects of it. Um, Ambassador Ward talked about the international relations aspect. Um, and um, we also heard from Ralston Hyman, he spoke to the economy and finally about the sports aspect of it. And a very important aspect of what Christopher Charles just did was not just speak about the problems, but also uh, some of the solutions. So we we have um, some questions. Uh, Moji, you want to read a question? Hello, everyone. So we've had some you know, we've had some people on YouTube listening to us, and they have uh, some questions. I'll just start at the top. First one is from Pat Northover. Interesting choice of authoritative figures here for the discussion on ontological security. Are there no Caribbean figures worth highlighting? Best, Gervin, Beckford, Sylvia Winter, Erna Broadbuck? We have a mic. Okay, you have a mic. So, okay, Herbert. Okay. Good one. <laughs> That's a very good question, Dr. Northover. I I think I think though that. Uh, when I listened to the different presentations, persons did point to various Caribbean persons, but uh, as we looked at uh, ontological security, I, I think the definitions came from uh, persons of who are Europeans. But uh, the bulk of work we're doing now in ontological security is really pinned on a lot of Caribbean scholarship. Uh, Barry Chavans, Brad Wade, and, and, and other persons. Thanks. Thanks, Herb. Another question we had was from Rashley Mitchell from our department. Hi, Rashley. She said, in response to Walston's presentation, she said, are there any positive moves towards economic ontological security? All you have presented is doom and gloom, exclamation mark. <laughs> You're not lying. 
I would say that if we wanted to be more ontologically secure from an economic standpoint, we have to change the major objective of macroeconomic policies. The major objective of policy now should be to accelerate growth rather than to pay down the debt. Now, we spoke about carbon. If you look at the carbon, if you look at Barbados, Barbados has a higher debt to GDP than Jamaica, 129%. But their primary surplus is 1% of GDP. And they are growing at 4.5%. Jamaica grew at 1.9%, the latest report that we got from the Planning Institute of Jamaica. So they have taken a different approach that they pay down the debt as projected, while at the same time spending on basic social services and improving the productivity of its workforce. A survey was just done that Barbados has the highest salaries in the Caribbean because it has the highest levels of education and the highest levels of productivity. Yeah. So the answer is no. <laughs> Want a policy change. Okay. All right. And then I think the last one is from Dr. Philip Bedwood Sr. He says, I'm grateful to be part of the audience listening to these passionate presenters, but I'm wondering why the church is absent from the discussion. Okay, come on. Just so that everybody can see your face on YouTube. <laughs> Amen. I don't represent the church, but I did mention religious identity in terms of a sense of self, because there are many Jamaicans who identify um, in terms of their religion. It's very strong. So from that point of view, they are connected to other Christians in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, and globally. And so that is good in terms of a sense of security and safety. But we, we have to also be mindful that how religious organizations operate, you have the righteous and the unrighteous. And what part of righteousness with unrighteousness and darkness with light. And so while it is good as a sense of self and you use it to connect and to preach and to, 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 do, to give charity and arms and so on, there's a, there's a uh, what I would say, um, something that concerns me in terms of how congregants separate themselves from others who are not members of the congregation. And so that undermines ontological security. So yes, Dr. Bedward, I agree with you that we could have discussed the church some more, and I did mention religious identity in terms of providing a sense of self that's safe and secure, but we must also look at the other side as well, that competition between churches and the fact that a righteous line is drawn between the righteous and the unrighteous and, 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 and the withholding of privileges and how, how, how we treat others based on the fact that they're not a part of our religion should be taken into account. So, yeah. All right, so let me just add, oh, I work in 17 countries and only four of those countries are in the global north. Uh, so the other 13 are actually in the LAC. And one of the things I've found is that when you go to, when you take the four areas like Ireland, England, of course, Canada and the USA, when you look at my work in those areas, what emerged very quickly in terms of church is, is that it is not a strong factor. But when you get into the LACR, what I call the colonized space, you find the church being very powerful. The most powerful I've seen is in Jamaica. Second most powerful would be in Belize. Uh, the countries, that the more Catholic the countries get, is the, is the more powerful those countries are, with the exception of Jamaica, that has the, 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 the strongest church in Jamaica would be Seventh-day Adventists. And what intrigues me is three sets of groups we find. We find young people who go to church alone, and we found them with average to weak ontological security. We have young people who, who are sent to church with relatives or friends, but the parents don't go, and we found them a little bit above average. 
But we found that the young people who go to church regularly or ritually with their parents, especially with both parents, to have the strongest ontological security. And when you when you hold Catholic Padibus or hold the, the 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 parentage or the parent support constant and just treat as variable church alone, we still found it not dropping significantly. So in other words, uh, what what the church became for a lot of these young people is a social space, right? Seventh-day Adventists have something called social on a Saturday evening where people will tell you over 20% of their relationships are formed after church, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> These things are very important to them. I see the Adventist people inside, they're laughing because they know, right? Uh, while uh, evangelicals have, they have conventions and they have other events and so forth. So what we found is that religious space not being seen as religion, but seen as a social space, and that provides some greater sense of security. However, that security falls as a child is sent, which then provides this conflict within the, with the, the children, with the young people, to say, my parents are not going, so why are they sending me? And it becomes a, they, they define it more as control rather than social, right? And, and then we see the ones below that have no centering. Uh, having poor ontological security. So we've seen a lot of work, and I've seen this, I think, in 12 of the countries we work uh, in terms of ontological security in the church. So the church does serve a purpose in ontological security. Just to oh. bring the point about the economy to a basic level. Now, if you are a wife and your husband came home and said, darling, I'm making more money, but I'm going to give the bank more money and I can't fix the house. I'm not painting the house. I'm not cleaning the garbage. I'm not cutting the lawn. And he does that consistently. What would you do? Right. Government has been consistently collecting more taxes and using more money to service the debt rather than send, spending on basic infrastructure. It's just as simple as that. Yeah. So you would fire him if you're a wife. Simple. <laughs> Okay. Did you have a comment on this? Are there other questions from the audience? Okay, so we'll get um, up to Coley and then we'll take your question. Oh boy, afraid to follow Ralston, but <laughs> to, <laughs> I am supporting in some respect. There is a, there's a reality that I want to put out there. Um, we have a clinical psychology master's program here at the university that we've been running for quite a number of years. And what our numbers have shown, because it's an intensive program, we only take on average 10 students per year. And what we've been seeing is that the number of Jamaicans who are enrolled in that program has been steadily declining. Last year, for example, we had um, two Jamaicans. This year we have one Jamaican. Um, it's uh, individuals from Trinidad and Barbados. We now have Belize and the Bahamas, et cetera. And we are happy to educate the people from the Caribbean because we do view ourselves as being a part of, the, of, of one body and, and want to promote the solution. However, the difference it's not that our Jamaican students are not interested in doing psychology. It's that there is no government funding for that. It's not a funded program. And so, whereas for med school, there's some amount of funding and the other nations, Trinidad and Barbados, those students are fully funded. Where is the proof of being serious about mental health and change? So. I don't know. Okay, we take two quick questions. Remember, we started a bit late, so we'll make it for those. We have about five to seven minutes. Two quick questions. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes, the mic. Right. Hold on, hold on.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph McLean. My question is, does boarding, boarding male students, does it affect ontological um, security? For example, in schools. So, uh, for example, boarding at a high school, does it affect security or having them, you know, attending school from homes? Who's going to take that? Uh, okay. Yeah, he's asking is, is if boarding um, has any impact on ontological security of the students. So, right. So on the one hand, I think it relates very much to what you were talking about, where there are situations where it, it can be helpful and then other situations where it, it isn't. Um, if you have a, a student from a volatile community who's able to board on a campus, if that campus provides... Um, uh, positive values and a, and a structure that's healthy, then absolutely that can aid with ontological security. If on the other hand, what happens is that students who have the same issues are being boarded together um, with very little support or only a show of support, but it's not really there, then what you're doing is creating a space for them to learn from each other and potentially um, get worse than than what was there before, which of course would be the reverse. Quickly, this is something I've spoken about publicly and I realize that most people don't want to hear it. Uh, boarding schools are for children who are functional, but mischievous like I was in high school. My mother was so religious. My mother was Jewish, most people don't know, but she sent us to a Sabbath church and very strict. And I was too perfect, so I was mischievous at school. So boarding school would do well for me because I was spanked but loved and the connection was there. Children who are traumatized by their parents and are abused constantly and so become violent. Boarding schools do not have the programs and the personnel to deal with these children. Right? So boarding school, it's a myth. Right? They don't have and she knows more than I do in a clinical program. The host master, um, host mistress, they are not trained to, 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 to treat with violent children. Right? So, so we should think out of the box. Thanks. Okay. Um, one last question. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Sandra? No? Right. Yeah, Sandra, well, go ahead. My population is the aging population. So I, I know that you're looking at youths and so on, but we're living longer. What about ontological security for our older adults as well as the caregivers of those persons who are living with um, cognitive impairments um, and who have been further diagnosed with dementias? That's a very good point because only 18% of the 1.37 million people who are working are in any approved retirement scheme. Only 18% remember that, and we have an aging population. And there has been no discussion. The Pension Industry Association have been trying to get a meeting with the finance minister to talk about things like auto-enrollment. And he hasn't turned up at any, at any of those meetings. If you notice, we don't hear that on a political platform. Those things are not sexy to talk about on a political platform. It's all about debt reduction. And one thing that we want to tell you, when we were negotiating with the IMF, the argument was to bring the debt to GDP ratio down to 60%. That's where we were in 1980. 60% of GDP by the year 25, 26. Up comes COVID-19, and we said we wanted to go back to the IMF and said we want to do this thing in 27, 28. Now the minister is insisting that they are going to still do this thing in 25, 26, sacrificing everything. The budget of the Ministry of Education is approximately 150 billion. 90% of that is for recurrent expenditures to pay the teachers. The primary surplus, the amount of money that we use to service the debt, is 5.5% of GDP. GDP is projected at $3 trillion. So that's $165 billion. So although education is the most important thing to transform the economy, we are spending more to service the debt to bring it to where they want it to be before time that we are spending on education. That's why we need a policy change. 
Yeah. Uh, is this a question or comment? A question comment? Okay, so we have like one minute left, so you have to make it. Um... <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Sancia Henry, and I appreciate being the last person to be short and quick. I must say I really appreciate the discussion this evening. For me, I'm a newbie, but I really appreciated the varying perspectives and how manageable mentally it was and relatable. And um, I was particularly inspired by the presentation by the ambassador. And it's still the phrase, a little bit tolerable, still plays in my mind. And I'm thinking about how we have been relating as a country internationally. And I wondered what was his perspective? Do we still conform to the phrase that we're a little but tolerable? Ambassador, <laughs> that is for you. <laughs> Well, one of the things really is that it imbued us with a lot of confidence in ourselves. And it's almost as if we were fearless. It, it wasn't violence that we were engaged in, but our arguments, our, our, our positions, we believed in those positions. And we could present them in a very robust manner. And people appreciated our frankness. They appreciated the fact that we stuck to our guns. Shouldn't use the word guns. But that we, we, we the points that we made, we could back them up. And we were in the right place at the right time of history to make those points and to make those positions very clear. It, it, it was a stage at which other countries really looked to us for leadership. And, and I had a personal experience back in 1976 when I was at the UN General Assembly on the Sixth Committee and we were drafting certain resolutions. And at the end of the day, before we voted, several ambassadors would come to us and ask us, what is Jamaica's position? So that we can let our foreign ministers know how Jamaica is planning to vote on a particular issue. They needed to know how we stood and what we stood for. Because they knew that we had some of the best arguments on these issues. And not just the best, but the most correct arguments. You, you know, there was a time when, when if we abstain on certain resolutions and the resolution is adopted, we get blamed for the resolution being adopted, because we were told that if we had voted against the resolution, it would have been defeated because many other countries would have fallen over. So, yes, we did it much with and, and, and But it is a question of being confident in who we are as Jamaicans and projecting that internationally. Okay, thank you. Somebody wanted a positive note, and that's a positive note to end on. Um, yes, he's, he, he's, yeah, he's telling you what the past was and what can happen in the future, right, um, Ambassador Ward? So, yeah, I, I'm going to let you close, but there's a, one issue I wanted to uh, just put on the table. You don't have to answer it. You don't, it, you don't have to answer it now, but there's a sense in which I think if we have this discussion again, we can uh, might want to problematize the, the, the concept because I mean, it occurs to me that one can be ontologically secure, but physically insecure. And in fact, there's a certain level of ontological security, which could actually be bad. And, if, yeah. and I've seen it in, in the literature where the Israeli the ambassador raised the Palestinian conflict, um, where the, the Israelis, um, are on would be classified as being ontologically secure, and by and and that is because 
they know that if, if something were to happen from the Palestinians, how their government would react. And in fact, that leads their government into a situation of conflict. So rather than um, try to resolve the issue, they continue with the same set of issues, with the same set of behaviors, which leads to ontological security, but physical insecurity. And therefore, there are times when the two may not mesh. And perhaps this is something that we ought to take into consideration as we uh, move forward in this discussion. Yeah, you have the fancy concept for it. Yes, thank you. Uh, you wanted to? Yeah, I'm not right. gonna close. You can close. I just wanted to say there are a couple more comments on YouTube I thought I should share. Just comments. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there was a question, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask the question, but you don't have to answer it. It's just a thought. That's again from Dr. Bedwood about Jamaica, could Jamaica's ontological security benefit from Freddie Hicklings's Dreamer World framework, especially in seeking to address security as a public health issue? Just, I'm just throwing it out. I don't think we're gonna talk about it. And then just to say that Pat Northover says we need a public education drive in every local community so they can demand better and stop being treated like disposable bodies in the sacrificial altar of debt and ego. And Rashley Mitchell says, what about the expansion of affordable housing balance is needed? Thank you so much for the, for the contributions from the YouTube audience. Very much appreciate it. And you can close up, chair. Thanks. Okay, so um, sadly, all good things must come to an end. And um, so we must bring this, uh, the, uh, draw the curtains on today's um, proceedings. Thank, thank you again, um, Ambassador um, Ward, for your um your comments and your wisdom with which you have um, intervened and spoken to us. Uh, I would also like to, to thank the other uh, presenters on behalf of the department, um, Ralston Hyman, uh, as usual, and his forthright manner. Um, Ralston, Ralston, they expect you that next time you come back here to present, present something positive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have to be, yeah. <laughs> Just pulling you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're leaving people um, ontologically insecure. <laughs> uh, Christopher Charles, again, thank you for your presentation on sports and um, on the solutions. Dr. Coley, uh, again, um, you brought the psychological, especially the, from a clinical side to this discussion. And the inimitable Herbert Gale, of course, who is a violence expert uh, among us, or one of the leading violent experts around us. I think this was your idea, right? And um, we want to congratulate your head of department for this. And of course, um, there is Moji, um, Dr. Moji Anderson, who is the chief chief cook and bottle washer. She's uh, put this all together. I'm just simply here smiling in front of you and she gives me instructions. Uh, <laughs> But most importantly, thank you, the audience. Thank you, uh, um, the uh, audience online. And those of you who have um, turned up here in person, thank you all for staying the course and for participating. Once again, thank you all. And we see you at the next full department uh, seminar. Oak, and please spread the word that they can go on the FSS uh, YouTube channel and share and discuss. Bye bye.